welcome to this MSSO webinar, What is Medra and How is it Used? My name is Suzanne Insur Shaker, or Shaker, both pronunciations are correct, and I will be your instructor for this webinar. Joining me today is my colleague, Hannah Eaton, who is an MSSO training coordinator. Hannah will be kindly facilitating our webinar today, and she has already gone over a few reminders on how to access your chat feature that enables you to post comments or questions. Hannah will be monitoring the chat as we go through the webinar, so please do post your questions as we go through the slides, and we can pause and address them in between sections. We will also try to leave enough time for questions and answers at the end. This webinar is scheduled for two hours. We will be covering a wide range of topics, and I will try to get through the material, if possible, within about an hour and a half, and we'll also try to give you a few demonstrations after which we will open the floor for questions and answers. If we run out of time, or if you think of a question afterwards, or if your question wasn't fully addressed to your satisfaction, you can always reach out to our help desk anytime, and our team will be happy to assist you. So the theme for this webinar is a general overview. So even though we will be touching on many topics, including coding and data analysis and MSSO tools, we won't be going into too much, too much detail into these areas. So for those of you who are interested in a deeper understanding of coding or data retrieval and analysis with Medra, we do offer webinars targeted to those specific areas. So we have a webinar next week on Medra Coding Basics and the week after that for advanced coding uh, on Medra. And if you go to our website, medra.org, on the right-hand corner is the calendar icon, and that will lead you to our scheduled offerings, whether they're face-to-face -face or webinars on the second tab, and you can choose the topic and the language of interest to you. This particular webinar will not be very, will not be very um, interactive, as it's meant to be a general overview, but we will start off with a round of introductions where I hope to know a little bit more about you, and for that, we'll be using the, the poll everywhere. Okay, so after that uh, long introduction, let's get started with introductions. So I'm your instructor for today. My name is Dr. Suzanne Insur Shaker. I'm a medical officer with the Metro MSSO team, a fairly recent addition to the team having joined uh, late last year. And prior to that, I've had a little over 20 years experience in the industry, mainly in clinical research, working with different CRO and pharma teams within various functional groups. I'm based in New Jersey on the East Coast of the United States. And um, to get to know a little bit more about you, we'll be using the poll EV. So the link is shown on your screen along with the QR code. It's also in your chat feature. So if you can access that and we will activate the, um, the poll to find out a little bit more about where you're joining us from today. So if you can go ahead and um, put a pin in your location. So I see someone from France. I see US, Canada, Brazil. And that's UK, I think. Awesome, very nice. Okay, more in Europe. Africa. It's wonderful to see folks from all different parts of the world. It's truly reflective of the widespread use of Medra since Medra is currently available in 132 countries. So it's great to see users from all over the globe. And by the way, Medra is also currently available in 19 languages and counting. Okay, also Australia. Wow. So thank you for your time today, whether it's early in your day or late in your day, we do appreciate you taking the time to join us. Our next question is, um, okay, so your experience with Medra. So if you can let me know just um, whether you are familiar with Medra, have you been using Medra? Are you a brand new user to Medra? Wow, we have somebody who's experienced in Medra. That's good to know. 
the majority as expected for this overview webinar are newcomers to Madra, so with very little experience or no experience with Madra. Okay. Okay, that gives us a good idea of the background. And then for for the next information, if you could let us know your primary role in uh, in your current organization, this allows you to select more than one if you do more than one role. But I'm just curious to see if um, you are a coder, if you are a reviewer, if you're in safety or data analysis or in academia. For those under other, if you don't mind, if you, you can enter in the chat feature specifically what other is, um, we'll be happy to add options, additional options in future slides. We're always happy to meet you. So I see a, a good representation from safety. Data analysis. I see more others, so um, please do post in the chat feature under comments so we know what others uh, signifies and we'll be happy to add those options in future slides in future webinars. For other, we have two people who've set in the chat. We have a clinical project manager trainee and a clinical data liaison. Thank you. Thank you for that. And thank you for adding the, the details, guys. All right, so I think we have a, a fair a fair overview. And the reason why I like the slide is because it, it gives us all an idea that Metro plays a part in the activities of so many different teams and functionalities. So this is a way to really show how adaptable Medra can be. And my hope is that you come away today with the sense that Medra is a tool at your disposal and that it's meant to be leveraged to best assist you with your different roles and your different operations. Awesome. Okay, well, I'm going to deactivate the polls and, and get started. Before we go into the, the meat of the presentation, this slide talks about our disclaimer and copyright information. So the first bullet point um, really signifies that the presentation is protected by copyright uh, to the ICH. And with the exception of the Medra logo and the ICH logos, you are welcome to use the presentation. So you can reproduce it. You can incorporate it into other works. If you want to use it for training other team members, in your organization, you can do so. However, you do need to acknowledge the ICH copyright at all times. And if any modifications or adaptions or translations are made to the presentation, please do not insinuate that these changes were endorsed or sponsored by the ICH. The second bullet point is legal verbiage and many of my colleagues presented verbatim. So this presentation is provided as is. There's no warranty of any kind and in no event shall the ICH or the authors be liable for any claim, damages, or liability from the use of the presentation. The third bullet point would not really apply to us be because we don't have third-party material in this webinar. So our course will go over the um, background information about MEDRA, how MEDRA came about, how it's governed and maintained, what are the MEDRA scope, structure, and characteristics, We'll describe the maintenance process of Medra, some of the Medra tools, and I hope we have time to do um, some demo. We'll describe principles of coding. Uh, we'll introduce you to the guidance documents, points to consider, and the standardized, um, briefly, uh, uh, a brief mention of the SMQ standardized Medra queries and wrap up with a question and answer session. So let's get started with the medical background with the Medra background and I like to start with the slide because I don't know if many uh, folks are familiar that Medra is owned by the ICH and was developed by the ICH and when I was thinking about introducing the background of Medra in, in this webinar I happened to also be listening to a professor present on a historical event and he said something I found interesting he said that when you're telling a story you should never start at the beginning you really should start way before the beginning. And although many of you, I think, already know that Medra started in the 90s, I wanted to take you back to the origins of Medra by taking you back a little bit to the origins of the ICH who created Medra. 
So if you look at the history tab on the ICH website, there's an interesting outline for the origins of the need to harmonize, where they say how different regions of the world varied historically on how they came to the realization that it was important to have an independent evaluation of medicinal products before they are allowed on the market. And sadly, in many cases, this realization came as a result of a tragedy. So I wanted to take you back in our story to 25th December, 1954. And at least that's when some sources believe was the date that the first thalidomide baby was born in Europe to a company employee. I'm sure many of you on the call are familiar with the thalidomide tragedy, but it's sad to say that after the birth of that first baby, it was not linked to the medication. So the medication went on to get approval. It went on to get marketed two years later in 1956, and it was advertised as a safe medication and sold over the counter. Eventually, other pharmaceutical companies around the world started to produce and market the drug under license from the original manufacturer, and it continued to be sold for another four or five years before the manufacturer even reported any suspected dangers. So at the end, by the time it was withdrawn in 1961, it had been sold by up to at least 14 different pharmaceutical companies in as many as 46 countries under at least 37 different trade names. And even then, it stayed in many medicine cabinets. So when we deconstruct this tragic story, we find it unfolds on, on many sad layers, right? We have the lack of sufficient testing before approval. We have the lack of communication and data sharing between organizations and between regions. We had a lack of adequate reporting and the impacted population was the most vulnerable, the unborn babies, with the effect on them being very horrific with permanent and wide range of different congenital deformities, whether external or internal, a large number of intra intrauterine deaths and early infancy deaths. Um, the scope is not clearly known because it's just based on estimates. So we have an estimated maybe 2,000 deaths, estimated 10,000 to 2,000 birth defects. Some have estimates as high as 100,000 impacted victims, some still alive even today. And these are all estimates because at that time there was no way to track all those who were exposed and to follow them. Plus there were intrauterine deaths and stillbirths that may not have been linked to the medication. And this was a time when there was also still some stigma about birth defects. So that also led to some cases not being reported. Um, in my own view, one of the saddest parts of the story is that the medication was being marketed as a safe sedative to help in morning sickness. So what a nightmare that was from our current modern day perspective of benefit risk analyses. In, in a way, that story exposed all the worst possible outcomes that could happen if a medical product is not thoroughly tested and the information shared about it before it's used on humans. But it did lead, tragic as it was, to the realization that we need regulatory oversight. And this led in the 60s and 70s to rapid increase in laws, regulations, and guidelines for reporting and evaluating data on new medicinal products. At the same time, this complicated matters in a practical and financial sense on the side of the manufacturers. They found themselves scrambling to comply with different and sometimes divergent technical requirements. This led to our uh, increase in R&D costs, health care costs, and um, restricted availability of medicines in different regions of the world as they tried to uh, enter those markets. So the so this was the idea behind the need for rational, rationalization and harmonization of regulations. And this proved successful when it was pioneered by the European Commission in Europe in the 1980s to develop a single market for pharmaceuticals. And at the same time, there were discussions between Europe, Japan, and the US on the possibilities of harmonization. So ICH was conceived and later born in 1990 um, specifically at a meeting in Brussels, right? And um, it had representatives from both sides of the equation, from the regulatory side, as well as from the industry side, from those three regions. So before we, we go further, I wanted to show you um, something on our website. So if you go to our website, medra.org, on the top right-hand corner, 
here, you see the ICH logo. And if you, if you click on the ICH logo and it takes you to the ICH website, as many of you I'm sure are familiar with ICH guidelines, the, the focus of ICH centered on four main areas, right? So you had the quality guidelines, the safety guidelines, efficacy guidelines, which many folks are familiar with, especially in your, if you're in clinical research. So um, for example, the GCP guidelines, the clinical study report guidelines, the E2 uh, pharmacovigilance guidelines. Many of these guidelines actually do reference MEDRA. So if you open up some guidelines and you um, you look up you look up MEDRA, the guideline itself will advise you which level of MEDRA you need to present if you're using MEDRA for coding your SAEs, right? So for this one is for the um, DSURs. I think another example is for the PBR. So the PBR also, when you look up MEDRA, it tells you, for example, if you're including MEDRA in your, if you're using MEDRA to code your SAEs, you need to include both the preferred term and the system organ class level in your summary tabulations. So other than efficacy guidelines, the fourth discipline is the multidisciplinary, which can, kind of arches over the, the other three. And the first one, in the multidisciplinary is in fact MEDRA terminology. So MEDRA was a product of the ICH initiative because they recognized early on that in order for this harmonization effort to be successful, they had to be able to easily communicate not only with each other, but also across different regions, across different indications, different product types, and across time. Um, and be able to compare each other's data. And that's where the idea for MEDRA was born. So there was a working group created and a standard decided upon, and that became the first multidisciplinary M1 ICH guideline. And if you, if you click on it for further information, it actually links you right back to our website. I thought that was, that was interesting and I wanted to share that with you. So now it becomes easier to understand the slide that MEDRA was developed under the auspices of the ICH and our activities as the MSSO team, the MEDRA Maintenance and Support Services Organization is overseen by the ICH MEDRA Management Committee, which is composed not just of ICH parties, but there's also the MHRA of the, of the UK, the Health Canada and the WHO as observer. So what is MEDRA? The acronym MEDRA stands for Medical Dictionary for Regulatory Activities. So the idea for MEDRA was created to support in regulatory activities, but that's, that's not the only scope for the, the use of MEDRA. And the word dictionary can be a little bit misleading because our understanding for dictionary is a book that has um, definitions. MEDRA does not have definitions. Um, the way I think about it when, when I explain it is that uh, a diction, when you look up the definition for the word diction, it's actually the choice and use of words and phrases in speech or writing. So MEDRA, for the intention of standardization, MEDRA is a collection of different dictions, or you can think of them as textual codes, which, mean that, which means that they are either different words or phrases used to convey a medical concept. So when you are quote unquote coding in MEDRA, what you are doing is you are selecting one of these dictions, one of these textual codes that best reflects the medical concept you have in its natural language, which is your verbatim. And there could be more than one um, term in MEDRA that is similar or uh, related to this verbatim that you're trying to code. These kinds of terms that are similar to each other are considered sibling terms or system t sister terms that really mean the same concept. So we call these lowest level terms and they allow for multiple ways of describing the same medical concept uh, as received in real, plat uh, in real practice under its natural language. So for example, you can say abdominal pain or you can say belly ache or you can say abdominal cramp but they all mean the same medical concept. 
So what is MEDRA? MEDRA is a clinically validated international medical terminology, meaning that any changes or additions that happen to MEDRA have to go undergo review by a medically qualified team in the NSSO. The terminology is used throughout the entire regulatory process from pre to post marketing and used for data entry, which we, um, which we associate with coding, selection of terms in MEDRA, retrieval, evaluation, and presentation. The main purpose of MEDRA is to be used as a standardization tool, and that's how it's going to help you in your product evaluation, monitoring, in your communication, in your electronic records exchange and oversight. And it's not just for pharmaceutical products that are drug products, but can also be used for biologics, vaccines, uh, drug device combinations, standalone devices, and any products which are regulated in at least one region, like even food or, or cosmetics. The way MEDRA is governed, because it belongs to ICH, so the ICH MEDRA Management Committee uh, appointed by the ICH Assembly is the one with, with the oversight responsibilities for MEDRA, and they are the ones who control the functionalities that we perform as the MSSO team. So this is a theme that keeps repeating in these slides, that the ICH MEDRA Management Committee meets regularly with the MSSO for this oversight. They are the ones who set the subscription rates. They are the ones who approve developmental plans and services that we perform as the um, MSSO team. So our role, the MSSO team, is custodians of MEDRA. We don't own MEDRA. We protect MEDRA, we maintain MEDRA, we distribute MEDRA, and we teach about MEDRA. So we like for our users to be um, very thoroughly um, familiar with MEDRA. We are governed by the ICH um, MEDRA Management Committee, which has multiple uh, stakeholders from um, from uh, across the, the industry, right? So you have input from the industry, from the regulators and other interested parties. And the we have a partner organization, which is the JMO, because one of the interesting things about MEDRA is when MEDRA was born, it was actually born as a twin. So you had the, the English version of MEDRA and you had the Japanese version of MEDRA and JMO organization are the ones who maintain the Japanese language MEDRA. So where do you use MEDRA? So MEDRA is meant to be applicable to all phases of development of medical products for human use. The only exclusion outside, outside of this box are animal toxicologies. So the terminology was developed for regulators and the regulated medical product industry in both pre and post marketing phases of the process, whether that's clinical studies, reports of spontaneous adverse reactions and events, regulatory submissions, regulated product information. So you're gonna see MEDRA terminologies in uh, regulatory authority and industry databases. You'll see it in ICSRs and safety summaries. You'll see it in clinical study reports, in brochures, in the investigator brochures, in core company safety information, marketing applications, publications, prescribing information, and for those countries who allow direct-to-consumer advertising, when they say this product can lead to the following adverse events, those are MEDRA terminologies as well. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about scope, structure, and characteristics of MEDRA. And when you think about what's outside of this blue circle, that's what outs, what's outside of the scope of MEDRA. And I like to think about it from the perspective of data collection design, because things that are outside of the blue circle, they tend to be data that's already being collected, standardized, and summarized without the need for a tool of standardization like MEDRA. So for example, clinical trial study design terms, you won't have uh, verbatims in MEDRA that tell you a, a double blind or single blind study, but you don't need that. It's already being summarized. Under patient demographics, um, MEDRA will not collect age groupings or gender or ethnicity. 
However, there are um, a few terms in MEDRA where gender may be relevant from a medical perspective, like for example, male breast cancer versus female breast cancer uh, would be relevant to differentiate from a medical perspective. Uh, but in general, we don't collect or we were not scoped for demographic terms, age being the same thing, right? So we don't collect um, uh, age information within MEDRA unless it is relevant to the medical condition. So if it's a neonatal or newborn condition, or elderly condition or perinatal conditions, those kind of those kind of terms would be found in MEDRA. When you talk about frequency qualifiers, so MEDRA won't have terms like frequent or rare or this occurred X number of times, but you may find a handful of terms that include, uh, for example, intermittent. Uh, MEDRA is not meant to describe severity information like mild, moderate, or severe, but there are a handful of terms that have mild or severe, like mild versus severe mental retardation. And of course, numerical values for results are not going to be in a standardized uh, database, but MEDRA will include terms that help you understand um, the quality of these results. So increased or decreased or high or low or positive or negative signals, those kind of the information would be in MEDRA. MEDRA is not also not scoped for specific product types. So it's not going to be a tool for standardizing any drugs, any equipments, devices, or diagnostic products. So if you are in safety or if you um, uh, deal with subject summaries and patient narratives, when you think about how they start and they say, uh, an X year old male, female subject with this specific ethnicity, participating in this specific type of study, taking this medication or using that device, all of this information is out of scope of MEDRA. What MEDRA is scoped for, it's um, the categories of terms classified as medical and health related. So for medical conditions, you find MEDRA terms that convey signs, symptoms, diseases, diagnoses, therapeutic indications, even if the, that therapeutic indication was um, a sign or a symptom or a disease or a prophylaxis of a disease or a modification of a physiologic function. You also see terms in MEDRA that cover names and qualitative results of investigations, like we said, increased, decreased, uh, present, absent, positive, negative. Uh, MEDRA can also be used for surgical and medical procedures, for um, medical history, social history, family history, for medication errors, for product quality terms, device-related issues or product issues, and of course for standardized queries. And if some of you may wonder, well, why are we considering social circumstances as medical terms? They can fall within the medical scope if they're relevant to the evaluation of regulatory data. So, for example, when you're assessing clinical outcomes of treatment in the light of exposure to risk factors like foreign travel or tobacco use or bereavement issues. So, let's talk about MEDRA structure. MEDRA is built as a hierarchy system. It has five levels that you can, um, that you can use either from a top-down approach or from a bottom-up approach, so the link would be vertical. Each level on the bottom is subordinate to the linked term in the level above it. And of course, each level on the top is superordinate to the linked term to the level below it. The level at which you do your coding, where you interact with MEDRA, would be the lowest level term. So this is the most granular level of term. It has the most number of terms at about 85,000 as of version 25 in the most released version um, just earlier this month in version 26 we reached about just under 87,000. These lowest level terms these are the ones that are meant to portray different ways of conveying the natural language term your verbatim as used in practice or real life. So groups of these LLTs can represent like we mentioned a single medical concept in which all the sibling LLTs uh, whether they are sister terms, semantically equivalent, or synonymous terms, they really mean the same concept, but they are worded a little bit differently. So out of this group of equivalent LLTs, 
one of these LLTs would be preferred to the rest to represent this standalone medical concept. This LLT that is preferred to the rest to be the representative of this unique medical concept would be duplicated again at the preferred term level. So what that means is that every preferred term level also exists at the lowest level term. So these 25,000 preferred term level, preferred term, um, uh, preferred terms in MEDRA are actually also existing at the LLT level with the same numeric ID. Now, as you go higher up in the hierarchy, related preferred terms can be grouped together under the HLT, the high level, uh, uh, high level term level. So this grouping together of related preferred terms can either be based on anatomy or pathology or physiology or function. And then again, the HLT levels that are related are grouped together in the high level group term, the HLGT level. And these in turn get grouped together under the system organ class. So you can see how the numbers contract significantly as you go from top from bottom to top, right? So you start with the highly granular level all the way at the, the bottom to only 27 socks all the way at the top. And that's how, well, this gives you an idea of how your signal gets condensed as you go from the LLT, well, starting from your natural language verbatim, um, you go into Medra by assigning an LLT, and then the signal goes all the way up to a system organ class. In many organizations, the summarization and the analysis starts here at the preferred term level. So this is a very important level. This is also the level that can be used in reporting and submissions, as we saw in those DSUR and, and PBR guidances, right, on that ICH website. So the PT level is a very important level. And the path that an LLT and PT take to the system organ class usually depends on the primary manifestation site. So if a medical concept that you're trying to code is a GI concept, you expect at the end of the day that when you assign an LLT that the link would be to the gastrointestinal SOC. And that's usually what happens um, across the board, but there are three main very important exceptions. If you think back to the thalidomide tragedy causing congenital deformities, it would have been very important to be able to um, uh, uh, signal those congenital deformities. So any event that may have a congenital etiology, that path would trump all else. So if a medical concept could have congenital etiology, but is also, for example, a cardiac condition with cardiac manifestations, it can potentially link to both system organ classes but the primary one would be the congenital. So we said that there's three main exceptions, right? Congenital being the first, uh, the second being cancerous etiologies. So that would be the neoplasm and malignancy SOC. And then the third exception is the infectious etiology, and that would be the infection SOC. And we'll speak more, more to this in, in future slides. So this gives you a list of all 27 system organ classes that MEDRA includes. So just taking a look at it, most of them are body systems because we said the majority of the linkages depend on the primary side of manifestations. So you see blood disorder, cardiac disorder, ear, endocrine, eye, gastrointestinal, respiratory, et cetera. But we also see the three main exceptions that we talked about, the congenital SOC, the infection SOC, and the uh, neoplasm SOC. And of course, there's other system organ classes that serve a different kind of purpose. So for example, the uh, general disorders, this is incidentally where you have your death information. Um, there's also a SOC for injury, poisoning, and procedural complications, investigations, surgeries, social circumstances, and of course, product issues. So they don't really fit in any of those manifestation SOCs and their standalone system organ classes. So let's see an example of a snippet, a small snippet of how this hierarchy uh, is linked in MEDRA. And as the note says, this doesn't show you all possible 
LLTs, PTs, HLTs, and HLGTs under the, the cardiac SOC is just a simplified example. So if you go from the bottom top and you look at the LLTs, you see different options for arrhythmia. You have standalone arrhythmia, you have arrhythmia that's not otherwise specified, and you may have dysrhythmias, right? And you may have previous terms that were added into MEDRA that are no longer current. So it's, um, I think, important to point out to you that um, PTs and LLTs are never removed from MEDRA. But if a term is found to be no longer in use, maybe because it's no longer useful or we'll go over slides, coming slides, what makes an LLT become non-current, then the status changes to non-current so it's no longer used. PTs don't have this happen. PTs, if they are found to be, uh, they're, they're not needed anymore as a PT, they get downgraded to an LLT and made non-current, and then they're, they're highlight, highlighted in red. So hopefully when we get the chance to give you a demo of the browser, I'll show you how Medra uses color codes. So red for an LLT means don't use it, it is non-current. And then you see how it links higher up. So we said how groups of equivalent LLTs, one of them would be preferred to the rest to represent this unique concept. For this group of equivalent LLTs, arrhythmia is the one that gets duplicated at the PT level. So it has the same exact spelling and the same numeric code. And then the PT would link to an HLT, weight and rhythm disorders not elsewhere classified. So this also gives you a hint that there must be other HLTs that have some kind of classification, right? And this and all those other HLTs that are classified would link to an HLGT of cardiac arrhythmias, and this in turn would link to the cardiac disorder. But you are able to search through MEDRA with a top-down approach. If you know that your term is a cardiac disorder, you can tell that it's a, a rhythm disorder, you're not sure what kind, maybe you can start here and start digging down. So there's two ways of approaching um, MEDRA. So let's talk a little bit more about non-current LLTs. So we mentioned that non-currency is only flagged at the LLT level in MEDRA. LLTs are definitely not for continued use. They are retained to preserve historical data or legacy data. So if you had older data, um, that was already mapped or coded to an LLT that eventually became non-current, you can still retrieve it, you can still analyze it, you can still trace it back, but you should not use non-current LLTs moving forward to code new information. And some of the reasons why LLTs become non-current, it's either vague, um, like uh, it's an acronym, uh, maybe it was ambiguous, maybe it became outdated now that more information has become available, maybe it was misspelled, or maybe it was even entered uh, incorrectly. So um, another group that became non-current, and I think it's also um, worth mentioning that when MEDRA was created, it was created based on a, ter a terminology that already existed and in use in the UK by the MHRA. So that was the basis of MEDRA, which incidentally explains why at the PT level and above, we see the terms are um, spelled in proper English or UK English rather than American English. But METRA also had a combination of terminologies that came from other um, databases like WHOART and COSTART and JART and ICD. But they don't really fit METRA rules, so they were made non-current. So here's an example. So as we said that, at least I, I think of METRA as a collection of uh, textual codes that have numeric identifiers, right? So every single term in MEDRA, regardless of which level it's at, LLT, PT, HLT, HLGT, and SOC, they all have numeric codes assigned to them that are unique. And each one of them is an eight-digit numeric code, and each one of them is non-expressive. So non-expressive meaning that when you look at the number, the number is not going to give you information as to which level in MEDRA it resides. It doesn't give you information if it's an LLT, whether it's current or non-current. It doesn't give you information whether it's a respiratory term or a congenital term. It doesn't give you any of that information. 
Um, it's just meant to represent a unique numeric identifier. The only information you can derive is that if the number starts with a one, it's a Medra term. If the number starts with a two, it's an SMQ term. But basically that's it. And they are assigned sequentially. So anytime a new term gets added to Medra, regardless of which level in the five hierarchy tiers is being added to, it's going to be assigned the next sequentially available number. But these numbers are really very, very helpful. They do fulfill the need in electronic submission types like the E2B submission, and they are unique to these terms. So you can always trace it back to these terms, and they are the same regardless of the different language of Medra. So even if the textual code is not identical between the different translations of Medra, the numeric code is identical between all different translations of Medra, which is really very helpful when you're comparing data and sharing information on a global basis. Um, one point I'd like to just bring up is that the numeric codes will never change as of version 5. So older than version 5, between 2.1 and 5, there was a small number of terms, term names that had their codes changed. But as of version 5, the numeric codes do not change. Okay, so um, the languages that are available currently in Medra are 19 languages, but that work is still ongoing. And the aim is to complete the entire list of 32 languages as shown on the slide. So let's talk about what it means that Medra is a multi-axial terminology. We talked a little bit before when we showed the hierarchy, how that LLTs can connect in the hierarchy to the system organ class that's mostly based on primary site of manifestation. And we mentioned that there's three main exceptions, right? The congenital, the neoplasm, and the infectious etiologies. So there are situations where the same medical concept you're coding could be linked to more than one system organ class, maybe because it has an etiological link to one of these three exceptions plus the manifestation or maybe because the concept itself can have manifestations in more than one body system. In these cases, the same LLT and the PT term that it's linked to could route up to more than one system organ class. So this is what we call a multi-axial representation, where the same LLT or PT could be grouped under different classifications that best meet your needs. This allows data retrieval and presentation by different sets of data, again, based on your specific needs. But we don't want to double count events. We don't want to count the same condition twice under these different SOCs. So there has to be a primary SOC assigned. And um, this primary SOC, that's the one that gets represented in your cumulative data outputs, which further supports standard standardization. The thing that I want to stress here is that the primary SOC allocation is predefined in Medra. This should not be changed by users, even if you have the ability to do so. Because if you change the predefined primary hierarchy, you're no longer using the standardized dictionary. So it's, it's not the standardized dictionary that the regulatory bodies will be using when they evaluate your data. So you should not change the primary SOC allocation. However, you can always customize the way you retrieve your data, the way you analyze your data, using all these possible secondary links, secondary SOCs. If we do have time at the end, I'll try to come back and give you a short demo on this, but we do have webinars for data retrieval and analyses that talk more to this. So here's an example of a term in Medra that is a multi-axial term. Not every single term in Medra is a multi-axial term, but there are terms in Medra that link to more than one SOC, and this is an example of one of them. So for influenza, influenza can be linked to more, more than one system organ class because it has an infectious etiology, so it links to the infection SOC, and it's a respiratory manifestation, so it links to the respiratory SOC. And as we mentioned, because of those three important exceptions in the primary SOC allocation, since one of those three is one of these two possibilities, the primary SOC will have to be infections in this particular term. 
So we'll talk a little bit now about the maintenance process for MEDRA. So MEDRA is a, it's a living, breathing dictionary. It continually evolves along within our collective medical and scientific knowledge. Uh, the majority of changes that happen to METRA occur as a result of chain requests from users just like yourselves. Every organization, every METRA user has an allowance every month for up to 100 change requests per month. All, all of these requests, every single one of them, is rigorously reviewed by our team of MSSO physicians. If it's a, uh, a simple change request, at the LLT and the PT level, you can expect a response within seven to 10 business days. And the response can either tell you that your request has been approved, or maybe your request has not been approved and here's why, or maybe it was approved, but not exactly as you submitted it and here's why, right? So um, if it's a complex change above the PT level, those do get posted for user comments because it has a huge impact on everybody who uses Medra. So we post them mid-year and wait for input from the larger um, MEDRA user community. To give you an example about the volume of change requests um, for this most recent version 26 release, the MSSO received and processed a little under 2,000 change requests and the majority of them, about 1,600, were approved. Um, so with every release of, of uh, MEDRA, the MSSO does provide um, all the MEDRA users with a detailed document. And this detailed document includes um, a cumulative um, report of all the changes that were submitted and the status, whether they were approved, or whether they were not approved, and a um, kind of a, a summary of the rationale behind the decision made. So the releases of MEDRA occur twice a year. We have the complex release every March. So the one that just came out, version 26, was a complex release, meaning that it could have potentially changes in any of these five level hierarchies in MEDRA. Uh, simple releases occur in September. So that those are, those are the ones with the X.1. So the next one coming out in September of this year would be 26.1. That would be a simple release, meaning that the changes can only happen at the LLT and the PT level. Okay, so how do you uh, submit uh, changes to um, the MSSO team? So as a user, well, as you're using MEDRA, and if you, th if you think of something and you go, man, I wish the term was added to MEDRA, or I, I wish this was linked to um, yet another SOC in MEDRA, how do I submit change requests for that? So it's a web-based tool, uh, as listed with the location on, on the screen. Uh, you can apply your change requests online, you can review them online before you submit them, and you receive immediate acknowledgement that the change request was received. One interesting um, feature in the tool that's available to all of you is that you are able to go back historically in the tool and look up um, any, any change request that was submitted as far back as 5.1. And even if you think of a term that you want to add and you look it up and you find that it was previously submitted and previously it was not approved, that doesn't mean you can't submit it again. So you can actually submit change requests that may have already been not approved previously if you have a stronger case for them. The tool itself um, is intuitive. So the tool itself will kind of guide you through what information it needs from you um, to be uh, a full, complete change request. And we do have an instructional video on our website under the, the training page that shows you exactly how to complete a change request. And I'll show you an example screen. We won't go through a demo in, in this webinar, but this is an example on the screen of what the tool looks like when you go in. So there are a lot of fields, but not all of them are mandatory. The majority of them are really optional. So if you want a term added, that's a required field. Tell us which term you want added. You don't have to tell us which links you think it can go up to, which HLTs and which SOCs it can be linked to. But if you do want to provide that information, just please bear in mind that these optional fields are autofill drop-down optional fields to help you avoid any spelling errors. So I don't know if you guys noticed or not, but the word injuries is misspelled on the slide 
And those kind of issues can happen if it was an open text field. We do recommend that you give us as much detail as possible in your justification. You can even um, attach supporting documentation like articles and such if you're interested, because it will help us really understand the need behind this change request. So the um, second type of maintenance that can happen to Madra is called a proactive maintenance. So this process allows users to propose more general kind of changes to Madra outside of the established change request process. It can also happen from reviews done internally by the MSSO team. So if you do have ideas about addressing inconsistencies or making corrections or improvements in Medra, we do, we do encourage you to submit those to our help desk and again, provide as much information and rationale as you can because it will help us evaluate this request. Um, this one does not have a specific uh, turnaround time because it does tend to um, take longer to review and consider. And this does not replace, of course, the usual change request process. My next section is on tools, but before we go too much into tools, I wanted to take a, a moment here and ask Hannah, do we have any questions so far? We have one question so far and it asks, so are Medra codes similar to the Medra codes found in the NHS system? So it, it really, um, not sure exactly what terms are available in the in the NHS system, but there are interoperability features that are available in um, many different terminologies, global terminologies. So um, if you think about, for example, SNOMED CT, that's a system that provides medical terminologies. There is a map that exists between SNOMED to MEDRA and MEDRA to SNOMED. Same for ICD, right? So if you use ICD, there is a map um, which we'll be releasing hopefully soon between ICD-10 and MEDRA. Um, but the Med MEDRA terminologies themselves, they come from MEDRA. So you need to be a MEDRA subscriber to be able to access all available MEDRA terminologies. So you won't see them available to you online um, in, in different um, uh, web bases or websites. I hope that answered your question, but if it was not satisfactory, please do reach out to us again and we'll try to address it again. Uh, any other questions, Hannah? No other questions at the moment and they confirmed that you did answer their question. Awesome, all right, very good. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about Medra tools. So there's three different kinds of Medra browsers uh, available to our subscribers, right? You have the Medra desktop browser, the MDB, the web-based browser, the WBB, and the mobile Medra browser or the MMB. The Medra desktop browser, if somebody has a question about which one to use, I think that would be up to your organization. So some organizations may uh, allow everybody to access the web-based browser using the, the Medra ID and password. Some organizations uh, prefer that their users download the Medra desktop browser and use that one. So um, the question of which one do you use is really up to your internal organization. But I'll walk you through the differences between them. So the way that I think about the Medra desktop browser is like it's an empty vessel. It's, it's already prepared with the inter functionalities um, where it can be used with the same features as the web-based browser, but it doesn't have files, right? So when you download the Medra desktop browser, you need to make sure that you download whichever release files you're going to be using and in whatever languages. So if you have uh, data that was previously coded to version 24, for example, and you're going to be working on the Medra desktop browser with that data, you need to download the 24 release files from our website and download them to the Medra desktop browser. If you want to be using different languages at your end, you need to download those files in the respective language. Um, that step is not needed for the web-based browser or the mobile browser because they're both web-based uh, web -based browsers, right? So they're both, um, uh, they're not in need of download at your end. All right, I'll give you a little bit of uh, information about the features of the browsers. So 
all of these browsers require the Medra ID and password to access them. You can view and search Medra terms and SMQ terms on all of these browsers. They all support the available Medra languages in whichever interface language that you prefer. And uh, excluding the mobile browser, you are able to export your search results and your search bin uh, results to your local file system. One cool feature about the web-based browser is that it allows you to view upcoming data that's going to be released in our next version. So these are called supplemental files or supplemental terms. So supplemental terms, when you're looking at the supplemental view in the web-based browser, your, your screen turns pink the way that the graph shows you uh, right now. And um, that basically means that these are terms that have not yet been released, but they have been processed and approved for the next release. Um, but both the desktop browser and the web-based browser, they offer you primary and secondary link information. You can upload your own uh, data to run against the SMQ tools, and you can use the advanced search options. This is a, um, a graph of what the web-based browser looks like. And when we go further into the slides to the coding section and hopefully do a coding demo, I'll walk you through the functionalities of the browser. But I want to talk first about our tools, our MVAT tools. So the Medra version analysis tool is another tool that's also available to all Medra subscribers free of charge. It's also web-based. And the, the functions that it provides are really three different kinds of functions. So first of all, it allows you to compare any two versions of Medra and export a report that tells you what changed between these two different versions of Medra. It also allows you to input data from your end uh, that is already coded in Medra and then identify changes against a more recent version of Medra and also output that into a report. The third functionality for MVAT is that it allows you to input a single term and gives you the changes that happen to that single term over its lifespan within Medra whether you enter it as a textual code, meaning the term itself, or whether you enter it as a numeric code. So the MVAT tool itself also allows you to um, interface with whatever language you're more comfortable in, input your data in the supported language if you want to use um, data other than English. It allows you to run reports also against supplemental changes. So if you know that you are waiting on something for the next release and you want to see how it's going to impact your current data, you can run it against supplemental changes. And you can also run reports against secondary SOC changes. So this is what the tool looks like. And I do want to give you a demo on the tool. So before we do the, the demo on the tool, let me show you how to get there. So this is going back to our website. Just close all the others and just take you to our homepage. So when you access our website and you are viewing our homepage, the landing page takes you to our welcome to Medra information in all the supported 19 languages. The bottom of your screen gives you the upcoming webinars. So you see the one that we're doing now, you see a couple from next week, and then you know some news, our link to our COVID page and the link to the um, change request process. So if you want a link to submit change requests, it's right there on our landing page. It takes you right there to the tool. Up on the uh, right-hand side, we talked about the ICH logo. Next to that is a link to our subscription information, which you really don't need because you are already Madra users. Next to that is our calendar icon. And our calendar icon takes you directly to our next offerings. So the first tab is our face-to-face -face offerings. And you can see that, for example, we have um, upcoming face-to-face -face user group meeting in Cambridge uh, in June. And it tells you how many seats are still available. The next tab gives you the webinars. So you can, both tabs allow you to either pick a specific course that you're interested in or pick a specific language that you're inter interested in. And of course, you can link into the here directly to go and register. The um, 
third icon, the one that looks like a house with a green chimney pointed up, this one is our support documentation. So our support documentation is basically the guidance documents that we provide to you to help you navigate uh, Medra and best leverage Medra. The support documentations are available in all of our supported languages, so you can pick the language that you prefer. And under the blue panel here are the, um, is where you will find the ICH endorsed guidance documents, the, one that we, the ones that we call uh, points to consider documents, which we'll talk about a little bit in coming slides. So the ICH did endorse um, a couple of these documents, the points to consider documents for the two main areas. The term selection, so if you remember we said coding in Madra is known as term selection because you are selecting the LLT term that best matches your preferred, your verbatim. And then there's a, a, a points, to, points to consider document for data retrieval and presentation. There's also a companion document and this companion document has a, um, a wealth of information about topics, for example, like medication errors. The best practices document is really useful. It also has sections uh, specific to versioning. So if you have questions about that, it's a good resource for you. Other than this blue ribbon, every release of Medra up until whatever fits on the page, so the, the most, uh, the oldest was 17.1, every single one of these, when you click on it, it offers you additional, right, guides and, and documents. So there's a introductory guide for Medra, which really has a wealth of information about the structure of Medra, the hierarchy of Medra, a few rules and conventions like how do you approach spelling or abbreviations or how do you approach gender specific terms. Really, really very helpful. So if you have questions about these kind of concepts while you're coding, do reference this as your first stop. You might have the answers right there. There's also an introductory guide for SMQs. And this one is a little bit larger. It walks you through how the SMQs were built, what was the um, background behind them, how they were developed, and then it talks about every single, every single SMQ, how it was designed, how it was defined, what's included, what's ex excluded within it, within it. And I forgot to tell you that in the um, introductory guide, there's also section that are specific for each system organ class. So it tells you about how, um, what the thought process was for each specific system organ class. If you just want a general overview, there is a nice Understanding Medra document on our website that um, really is a short document, maybe 20 pages, doesn't go into a lot of detail. So similar to this overview, where it gives you a general overarching view of Medra and um, a statement on Medra data sharing, who you're allowed to share Medra data with, who do you need to um, check on to make sure that they have subscription to, to Medra, and our uh, published lists, right? The patient-friendly list, the unqualified test name list, and we also give you our transition date. So for example, with this recent release of version 26, the expected transition date would be the 1st of May. That's the first Monday of the second month after the release. Okay, other things I wanted to show you on this um, page. So under training, there's your training curriculum. Training curriculum is really a, a, a useful roadmap that can walk you through how to get better acquainted with Medra. So if you're a newcomer and you're wondering, well, okay, I did this course, where should I go next? This is a really nice roadmap for you. It walks you all through to the more advanced courses and it gives you um, advice, which is the best um, offering that best meets this need. So should you um, schedule a webinar? Should you schedule a face-to-face? -face? Do you want to link to a video? So these acronyms for V is for video and it tells you we have these videos already available to you. So maybe you want to look here first. So for example, how to submit change request is right here. If you go back to it, to the, uh, to the curriculum, it also has a link to our YouTube channel. So we offer previously recorded webinars and if you have a um, uh, preferred instructor, you can look them up and you can access the, um, 
their webinars, the ones that they presented and recorded in multiple different topics, and you can choose different languages as well. All right, so uh, we talked about the training tab. Let's talk a little bit about the how to use tab. The how to use tab is where you find your support documentation. So there's multiple links within our website that takes you back to the same information from different ways. So you can go back to the support documentation under how to use. There's our link for the change requests, for mapping, for the uh, self-service application, and the tools. So here is where you will find your, uh, your tools. I just wanted to show you another link to, before we enter the MVAT, I wanted to show you another link for the self-service application. If you're not sure what your Medra ID is or what your Medra password is, you can always retrieve it through this tool. Uh, you just need a valid email that belongs to the uh, organization that has a sub subscription to uh, to Medra. You can choose your interface language on this tool. You can check on the subscription status. So if you're working with another organization, you want to make sure that they have a valid um, subscription to Medra. This is where you request information or retrieve that information. And you can identify your Medra point of contact through this tool. So going back to our tools, so here's where you'll find um, uh, information about the browsers. You can open up the web-based browser or you can open up the mobile browser or you can download the desktop browser. You can have the um, user guides. So they're all available to you. But for this purposes of our demo, we wanted to talk about the Medra version analyses. So if you click on that, there's two ways where you can access the tool. There's a link right here and there's a link right here. They both take you to the tool. But before we access the tools, I wanted to show you a training offering that we have on the Medra version analysis that's really helpful. So when you click on that, it takes you to a couple of training materials available. And if you open up the tools for the Medra version analysis tool and scroll down, you're going to see recordings in a few different languages on MVAT demo. There's a part one and a part two, and it's really a very good quality um, demonstration that you can review at your leisure, pause and, and stop and follow along with if you want to practice on your own. But let me let me take you back to um, the how-to tools and let's log into MVAT for our demo. So when you first land on the um, login page for the MVAT, you can select the interface language you're more comfortable with. I'm going to leave it at English and log in. Within the tool, you still have the option to change your interface language. So if you're more comfortable with a different language, you can change the interface language and keep your data in English. You can select your interface language and select your uh, data language as well. So let's go back to, to English. So we said that. MVAT serves three main uh, roles or functionalities to help you, right? The first one is that it compares two different versions of Medra. So when you're on the home page, this is the, the function that it's going to be serving. It's going to be comparing two different versions of Medra. You have the option to specify which system organ classes you're interested in identifying changes between two different versions. So you don't have to run the whole thing. So if you're working on a specific kind of product and um, you're interested in a specific group of system organ classes, you don't really want the, the rest of the clutter, then you can specify them. You um, press down control and you specify which system organ classes you're interested in. You can do it uh, as it's defaulted across the entire range of all 27 SOCs. You can tell it I'm interested in secondary SOC information or maybe no, I'm not interested in secondary SOC information. As a reminder, the starting version of Medra has to be older than the ending version of Medra. But if you decide that you're going to do it opposite, the system will tell you uh, you can't do that. So you have to choose a starting version that is older than your ending version. So let's see what changed between 25.1 and 26 and run our version report. 
when the when the um, report outputs it gives you the ability to view the results directly on the screen and it also gives you the ability to export your results in an excel format so hopefully we'll be able to show you um, both of them as it loads the data in the meantime hannah any more questions the only question we had was asking if the desktop browser is compatible with Mac. Uh, I don't know the answer to that. It is not. Unfortunately, at the moment, it is not compatible. So Mac users will need to use the web-based browser or the mobile browser. All right. Thanks, Hannah. Um, any other questions? That seems to be it for the moment. Okay, awesome. All right, so the when you run the report and it outputs, it's gonna first tell you what your starting version was and what your ending version was and whether or not you chose to include the secondary SOC information. So for this demo, we're not including secondary SOC information. In the um, output summary below here, it's gonna give you a couple of different reports. So the report numbers go from 10 to 20 to 30 up until like 80, 85, 90, 100. So each one of these is a different kind of report. Um, the column here with the numbers, this tells you the total unique terms that showed up in this particular report. So for example, Report 10 will tell you how many new LLTs, including new PTs, because remember we said every single PT starts as an LLT, right? So this row tells you how many new LLTs have been added between these two different versions. So you can see, remember how we said there were over 2000 change requests that were submitted from Metro users to the MSSO and about 1600 were approved a large portion of them were requests to add new terms, right? So this is where these LLTs usually come from. So how many of these were PT levels? That's your next report. So 374 of these were new PTs. It also tells you that 15 LLTs in version 25.1 are now promoted and they show at the preferred term level in the version 26 and 65 preferred terms have been demoted from version 25.1 and now show up as LLTs in version 26. And that 209 LLTs in version 25.1 have been moved and now show up under different preferred terms in version 26 and so on and so forth. So every single one of these reports will tell you exactly what the output conveys. And I want to show you an example of this one. So there were term, uh, term name changes. And if we click on view detail, right then on the screen, it will give you the output um, with the Medra code, the term in 25.1 and the term in 26. What this particular report is telling you is that between 25.1 and 26, there were two terms that had the term name changed. And usually this happens because maybe there was um, a, mis a misspelling. So for this particular example, I guess the, the Sordelli should have two I's instead of the single I. So this was caught and corrected in 26, but you'll notice that the codes stay the same. So the numeric code did not change, even though there was a minor tweak to the term itself. So every single one of these, if you click on it, the screen itself will give you an output. So starting with the code, the LLT, and then what happens to the term. So if it's new, that means there's nothing from 25.1. This is your 26, and this is the primary SOC uh, that it routed to or it mapped to. If it's a uh, demotion, for example. So if it's a demotion, then it will tell you that this is the um, PT code and um, this is the uh, term. Right, so it gives you the code and it gives you the term. If it is a moved, so if it moved from one to the other, it will give you which preferred term it was linked to in 25.1 and which preferred term it's now linked to in version 26. 
Now, it's maybe hard to navigate through all of these, so maybe you want to export them into Excel. You don't have to export everything if you're not interested in everything. You can unchoose the default of all of them, and you can tell it, I'm just interested in, um, for example, these four particular reports. Or maybe you are interested in all of them, and you want to export that to your um, Excel sheet. So once you hit export, selection, it exports it to your um, downloads and you can open up the file. So let's just see what the file looks like. Okay, your summary tab. So the file comes out in an Excel sheet with multiple tabs. Every single tab is a separate report. Your uh, summary sheet has the column that says report title. And if you hover over it, that um, red delta in the corner, will give you the detail of what this report really is telling you. So for example, the new LLTs, including new PTs, is exactly that. It tells you which new LLTs were added, which one of these are uh, PT levels, and then it gives you the um, primary SOC. If you're opting to choose secondary SOC in your version report, it will also give you any SOCs that are a secondary link to these new terms. So the same applies for all of them. So every single report has a nice detail about what exactly it's telling you and how many terms um, this impacted. And then of course, for the exact terms, you can go through the tabs themselves. You can see the, the changes themselves, right? And it gives you all the information. So you have this all available to you and you can save it to your, um, to your folders. So let's go and do, oh, let me go back to the tool. So let's go and do a different functionality. So let me go take you back to the MVAT home. So we're back at the home page, but this time you want to look up only a single term. So for that, a single term, you choose the search term change. So it only allows you to enter a single term, but again, it allows you to enter um, the data in any different language that you like. Uh, one thing I will point out to you here is that the tool can recognize numeric code. It can recognize the complete term the way that, and if you hit enter, it can recognize the complete term as long as, as, as it's an exact match to how the term appears in Medra, regardless of the language. It has to be an exact match. The, the, um, the open text field here in the MVAT tool is a little bit different than the one in your browser, because the one in your browser allows you to put portions of a word, but the one in MVAT allows you to do that, but only if you use the wildcard. And I'll show you an example, but let's look at this output. So for this particular term, I put the term exactly the way it shows in, in Medra. And if I click view change history or without clicking that view change history, because it's only one output, it, show, it gives me the output on the bottom. So basically this is telling me that this particular verb, uh, term was added in version 26. And right now it's in it's the current placement. And it tells me which system organ classes the term links to. And the blue box is the primary one. So if you see a blue box uh, around the system organ class, you can tell that this is the primary system organ class that this term links to in the Medra hierarchy. So another example, I said I wanted to show you something where you can put in uh, a section of a, of, a of a word. If I'm interested, interested in nasal drainage and I just put in parts of the term, not the full term, and I hit enter, the system is gonna look for it and look for it, but then it's gonna tell me I couldn't find it because the MVAT uh, tool for a search term change is not designed similar to the browser where it can um, pull up every possible combination that has those. If you just wanna use sections of, of a term, you'll have to introduce the wildcard. But if I do introduce the wildcard, the percentile sign, and that's when I hit uh, enter and look it up, it's gonna give me all possible combinations that have those two sections of those two words uh, that, it, that it found, right? Here is where I need to click view change history. So if I'm interested in 
nasal drainage, I see one that says nasal sinus drainage, and let me click on the view change history. And depending on how much information it's sifting through, it might take a bit of while, uh, a bit of time for it to give me the, um, the information. Okay, so here we go. So let me scroll down, and I hope you can see the, the screen very clearly. But um, it tells me that this particular term started out in Medra in version four. So it was added to Medra in version four. It was added at the preferred term level, and it was linked primarily to the respiratory system organ class. But then when we got to version five, I see that there was a change to the term. I see that it moved to, and it's highlighted yellow, right? The same term is the one in yellow. It moved to the LLT level, and it's in red. It's in red with a red box around it. So if you remember, we said that red means non-current. So in version five, this was made not only um, non-current, but it was demoted. Remember, we said that preferred terms don't become non-current. You demote them first to LLT, and the LLT becomes non-current. And not only that, it was linked to a preferred term that's different, and it was kept under the same uh, primary system organ class. And then in 5.1, again, the currency changed. So it was promoted again back to a preferred term level. It's now current. And the assignment for primary system organ class was reassigned. So you see all the summary of the changes here. And now it's linked primarily to the surgical system organ class. And then in version 9, it was demoted back again to an LLT level and linked to a sinus operation, but kept under the same primary system organ class. So it's a very useful tool if you have a one single term that you're interested in and you, and you want to trace it back. Excuse me. So that was our second functionality by the MVAT tool. There's a third functionality that's also popular. It's called the data impact report. This particular functionality allows you to input your data from your end and compare it to any other version in Medra. But there's a few things you have to bear in mind. Your data must be data that's already been coded to Medra. So you are inputting at the LLT or the PT level. You're not inputting verbatims, right? If you input a verbatim and that verbatim does not have a match in that version of Medra, that's, that's your starting version, the tool will tell you, I don't recognize this, and it's not going to process that row. The second part to bear in mind is that if you're using this tool to compare your data to what will happen to it in future versions, your starting version here must be whatever version your data was coded to. So other than that, if you, if you don't make sure that your starting version matches the version that your data was coded to, you're not going to get an accurate output. You probably will get an output because these are Medra terms, but you're not going to get an accurate output, right? So two things to bear in mind. Again, you can input different languages. You can choose your um, interface language. You can choose to show secondary SOC information, or you can say, I don't want secondary SOC information. And it reminds you, as usual, that the starting version must be the older one than the, um, must be the older version compared to the ending version. All right, so um, this the blue box here, it's really just kind of a reminder to you uh, of the things we just said that the starting version is older than the ending version, and also a reminder that if you are comparing two versions that are non-consecutive, so you can do that both in the data impact report as well as the version report, you can compare two versions that are non-consecutive. But if you do that, please remember that that's what the comparison output will tell you. So for example, if you had, this is the example it tells you here, so if you had a Medra version 6 and you're comparing it to Medra version 12, uh, any changes that happens in the, in the um, interim will not show up. Right? So if you have a, uh, a term that was added in, in 6 and then uh, maybe demoted in 7, then promoted again back to the same level in 8, and you're comparing 6 to 12, those stepwise changes are not going to show. 
So just a, just a reminder about that. Okay, and then um, how do you import your data? It's really easy because your source data doesn't have to be uh, a large or complicated set of information. We just need three rows. We need an Excel sheet and three rows. Your first row is your row ID. That's really optional. The, um, the use or the usefulness of this row ID is that if you do enter information, whether it's just numbers or it's a specific case ID that you're interested in, the output will tell you when it identifies changes, which row that change pertains to. So that's the, the usefulness of this row ID, but it's not required. So as long as you keep the header, if you don't wanna include any information, you can keep it blank. The second column is your um, term level. So if you're uh, using it for uh, data that was uh, available to you at the LLT level, you can uh, input LLTs. If you're using it for data at the preferred term level, you can input preferred terms. And um, the third is the code. If you're using English, if you're doing this in the English language, either one of this will be sufficient. If you're using any other language other than English, then either provide both of them or just the codes. Uh, the maximum number of rows for now that you can input is 100,000. And like we said, the data impact report assumes the uploaded data are existing MEDRA terms, meaning that the, they have to be already coded in MEDRA, they're not verbatims. So it's not gonna tell you about new information right, being included. All right, so how do, we, how do we do this? We have to choose a file. So when you choose a file, it allows you to navigate through your folders and pick a file. So I have a file prepared for the MVAD demo. So I just selected that file and I clicked next and the tool will take its time to think about the output. Um, if I remember correctly, I did not select the secondary SOC for the purposes of this demo. I just selected the primary SOC. So it's gonna think about it a little bit before it gives me the outputs. One important point is the tool does not retain your data. So once the tool provides you with your reports, you can go back and find this again. If you um, forgot to export the report or if you timed it out, you moved away from your computer for a reason and it timed out and you came back to it, the data was, was not going to be uh, retained, uh, right? So um, if you forgot to export the report and you need it uh, a later time, you have to run it again. So just like we saw in the version reports, uh, the tool will give you your starting version. It will give you your ending version. It will tell you whether or not you selected to include the secondary SOC information and gives you a little bit more information. It will give you the total number of rows that you uploaded. So I up uploaded 201. It told me that all of them were valid. So if I had one of those rows was a verbatim that was not coded, it will give me an error message and tell me there was the following row was not identified as a valid data. So that row was not processed, but it would process all the other rows that it found to be valid. And it would tell me what percentage of data was impacted. So in my example, only 1% was impacted. And similar to the version report, it gives me the report number on the left you'll notice there's no 10 or 20. So there's no new, new terms, like we said, these are all existing terms in MEDRA. So there's no new term reports out, report outputs for the data impact report. There's also no complex report output when you do data impact report. It doesn't tell you the changes at um, levels higher than, than the PT at the HLT and HLGT level. But it gives you the same kind of information. There's promotions, there's demotions, there's LLTs that moves from, from one to the other. Now, which one of these impacted my data? Because I see numbers in two columns. The first column is just the total unique terms between these two selected um, versions that you chose. Here are the total unique terms that happen to change between these two versions. But as it impacts my data, most of them are zero. So there's only a couple of changes. So for example, if I click on comprehensive LLT changes, I see that this LLT term had a change in the PT from between version 25.1, it was asthma, and now it's linked to PT bronchitis chronic under version 26. 
if I click under um, primary SOC changes, this is primary SOC changed for the LLT excluding PTs because you have a primary SOC change specific to PTs. So for this one, it's telling me that this particular LLT vaccination adverse reaction in 25.1 was linked under the immune system disorders, but in 26, it linked to this particular preferred term and it goes to the uh, system organ class injury, poisoning, and procedural complications. And not only that, it tells me which role in my data this was in because I have a numeric identifier for my rows. So this is where that subject ID or numeric identifier for the row comes in handy. All right, this also enables you to export in Excel. So again, you can uh, ignore the default all and just pick the ones that you want, or maybe you want to document it to show that there were no other changes in the other areas. So you want to choose all of them and you want to export it to your um, uh, files and you want to save it. So you export to your downloads, you can open it up. And it's very similar to the version report, right? The, um, the red deltas give you the details of what each report is telling you. And then um, the summary output for your particular data is in column C. This summary output is in general for the unique terms between these two versions. These are in general the, the, the changes that happen. But your particular data is in column C and the tabs are specific to your data. So there's the one that I saw for my comprehensive LLT change. I don't have anything under demotions or promotions, right? And you can, of course, save it as you like. So that was that was the demo for uh, for the MVAT tool. So let me go take you back to our slides uh, and talk a little bit about coding. All right. So why do we have coding conventions, or what are coding conventions when? When we think about uh, data retrieval, um, I know we many of us are uh, familiar with that old adage of saying garbage in, garbage out, right? So when, when you want good quality data in your retrieval, you want to focus on good quality data in your data entry. And when I say data entry, there are two, two arms to that. So you have the data entry from the reporter side, meaning your natural language term or your reported verbatim but you also have your data entry from your coding side, which is your step of selecting the term that best represents your natural language term. If you want quality output in your data retrieval, you need quality in those two steps. So coding conventions really give you a way to achieve better quality in your coding by um, improving consistency, right? Um, and it addresses certain topics. So for example, how would you approach misspellings? How would you approach abbreviations or acronyms in your organization? So it's really important for every organization to have coding conventions. These coding conventions may be created globally for the organization. They may be created per department, even per product line. But my advice to you is that if you do that, please ensure that you have a common theme across and that you're not um, introducing different approaches for different departments or different product lines. Um, your coding conventions could also um, factor in on combination terms. So going back to that points to consider document, the points to consider documents will give you recommendations to consider, right? They don't force you to follow a certain approach some of those points to consider may give you more than one recommendation and it's up to you to decide your best approach. So in those situations, your organization specific conventions are the best way to capture how you are approaching these kind of combination terms or which terms you don't want to um, auto encode or allow to auto encode and you really want to query, for example, like uh, chest pain, right? So the um, coding conventions can be needed because folks are different. They have different backgrounds, different experiences, different aptitudes. Also, we have a um, 
a good number of uh, granularity in MEDRA, as we saw a large number of LLTs. So there's more choices to sift through, and that can be concerning to achieve consistency. And even if you had an odor encoder at your disposal, you still need to do a, a manual review because the odor encoder may, may make mistakes. So I think uh, one of the common examples that um, my colleagues present is like um, the, the subject had a um, heart attack in the fall and the odor encoder may interpret fall as the actual physical falling down, right? So there, there could be mistakes done by the odor encoder app um, and it doesn't have the medical aptitude to really think about terms medically. So you always need to do a, a manual review. The, um, the Metro support documentation that I showed you includes one of the documents that is uh, ICH endorsed, which is the points to consider document. This is what it looks like when you first open up a document. So this is an example of the document that was released in last March. There is a release with this March as well. Um, so the um, purpose of the PTC document is to give advice for both the industry and regulatory purposes. The um, approach in the PTC document, so again, it's called a points to consider document. So these are things you wanna think about when you look at them, because many of them offer you multiple options. They may give you a preferred option, but they will offer you multiple options. And as long as you document which one you're following and why, um, that's a very important point because it will show any um, reviewer, any coder, uh, any auditor exactly what were the considerations that you took in and the decisions made based on what. So this PTC document is really, really very useful and important document. I do advise you to read it uh, thoroughly, completely before you're coding. It answers a lot of questions that you have and it can really be a good basis for creating your own organization specific coding conventions. These PTC documents are developed by the ICH Management Committee. They are up updated annually every March, and um, they are released in their full versions in up to six or seven languages. But the other languages that are supported by Madra do have these, but in a condensed version. And of course, they are available, like I showed you on our website and the JMO website as well. So here's an example of a general principle for coding. We said that when you select a lowest level term, you must make sure that it's current. So don't code to non-current LLTs. When you select an LLT, select the one that most accurately reflects your natural language verbatim. So for example, if your verbatim is an abscess on the face, it's not enough to code it to abscess because that's not the closest one available in Medra if you can find facial abscess, that would be the one that is the closest match to this verbatim. And we can't stress this enough, do not use non-current LLTs when you are coding. Non-current LLTs are only meant for legacy and historical purposes. The other point that is also stressed in the conventions is that don't leave anything uncoded, meaning that if you receive information you need to make sure that the entirety of the information is coded, otherwise it's lost. If you don't code it, you don't retrieve it in your data analysis. So you need to select terms for every adverse event or adverse reaction or adverse device effect that you receive regardless of causal association. Um, Medra will help you find terms that are relevant to device terms, product quality issues, medication errors, investigations, et cetera, as we mentioned before. So here's an example. Even though Medra is highly granular, it's not expected to offer you every single possible combination for every single medical concept. So headache, yes, we do have headache in Medra, but we're not gonna have throbbing above temple in Medra. But from a medical perspective, throbbing above your temple is another way to say headache. So in certain circumstances, you will be quote unquote, translating the term into a Medra LLT through your term selection. Other examples where um, the, um, uh, the match is not 100% exact is when you have um, multiple versus singular in Medra. So infection in lungs 
is a lung infection in Medra. But when you have information like this third example here, so the patient took drug A instead of drug B and had hypertension, what this verbatim is telling you is more than one single medical concept. It's telling you the subject had hypertension, but it's also telling you something happened during the drug administration. And both of those medical concepts are important to be captured in your LLT selection. Now, one of the questions that may come up is, well, I, I, I can't assign more than one code in, in Medra. Um, in your app, whatever coding app that, that, that you are using, that, that would be a consideration to be discussed internally because there are apps that allow, I'm sorry, allow you to select more than one LLT and there are apps that don't. So it's up to your internal organization to have those discussions and say, if we have more than one single medical concept per verbatim, how are we capturing the multiple LLTs? Are we splitting? Are we using any enhancement features that allow us to do that in the same app or not? The term selection points to consider document has a wealth of information um, about so many different things. I mean, this is just an example and we have another slide with, with a lot of examples. So if, if you have questions about um, body site versus event specificity, if you have a, a suicide or self-harm term, if you have the death term or provisional diagnosis term, how would you approach that? There are so many different things in that um, points to consider term selection documents that walks you through how to start your consideration of those terms. Here's even more options, right? If you're thinking about overdose or poisoning or drug interactions, what if you don't have any AE at all, if it's a normal term? What if it's an off-label use? What if, what if it's a medication error? How would you approach that? So a lot of information in those PTC documents. Again, I highly encourage you to read the entire document, start to finish. So we said that the ICH endorsed uh, guidance documents, there's the term selection PTC document, and then there's the data retrieval and presentation PTC documents. Uh, they are both updated annually with the March release of Medra. They are both available in their full versions in about five or six languages, English included, and they are available in condensed or shorter versions in the remaining languages that are Medra supported. Of course, if, if a language is provided as an abridged version of PTC, it won't be um, repeated again in the full, full version of it. We also talked about an additional companion document that offers you a bit more detailed information in certain areas, such as the medication errors, and these are updated as needed. This PTC, uh, this um, companion document is available in English and in Japanese. Okay, so let's go through um, a coding demonstration with the browser, but I'll try to make this quick because I also want to give you a chance to ask questions. So let me take you back to our homepage right here. If you remember, we said under how to and tools, you can access the browser and right here under WBB, you can access a quick link to our browser. Again, you can select the languages that you feel comfortable with for your interface. You can also select up to three different, three different languages in your, um, in your review. Uh, let me go back to English. Just a quick overview on the top here uh, under Medic Medra concept descriptions. These are not definitions, but these are helpful tools that help you um, get an idea of what a term is thought of in Medra. So how Medra approaches overdose or off-label use. Really very helpful when, when you're coding. Um, in terms of new browser window, so if you're looking at a term in Medra and you're interested to keep it, but you want to look at something else, you can open a second browser window and do a, a totally new review while keeping the first one. You can also look up uh, search history, similar to the MVAT one that we just showed you about the, the search term. There's a user guide with all the different functionalities of the browser right at your fingertips. There's even a link 
to our Medra documentation. So if you're in here and you say, oh, I wish I, I could have a, um, I want to open up my uh, PTC document, there's a link right in there, right? And then there's the legends. So going back to that cardiac disorder, remember when we talked about cardiac arrhythmias and we said that's not the only one that's available to you. There's so many others that are available um, to you. Let's open up cardiac arrhythmias, rate and rhythm, and EC, and look at all these different colors. So the legend tells you what these colors are, but I'm going to give you a shorter description that was taught to me and I found very helpful. If you see a preferred term with a blue box around it, that's kind of like your blue ribbon. That is, that is the one that won. That is the one that is linked to this system organ class as a primary sock. But it's blue because it has other socks that are linked to it. So if you click on it, if you click on this term, on your right-hand side is the window for your term de details. And you can see here that this particular PT is linked to more than one system organ class with the cardiac system organ class, the one showing up in the blue box. So blue box means that for the PT, means that it is multi-axial and the system organ class that you're on right now is the one that's primary. If it's green, it means keep going. So green means go, right? So if it's green, that means it is linked to more than one system organ class, but this is not the primary one. So when you click on it and you look under term details, you'll see the blue box is a different one. So for this particular term, the blue box is the congenital sock. Red means stop. So red means that this is not a multi-axial term. The term, the sock that you're on is the only sock that's linked to this PT and you can see it here. And of course you can drill further down. You can do, go from each PT into all the possible LLTs that are linked to it. So that's one way to link, to, to look at it. Um, we said that the W uh, browser allows you to look at supplemental English. So when you click on supplemental, everything turns pink. It means that you can look up terms here that are not yet in the release, uh, but it, it will be in pink, right? It's not going to be in the files that have already been released to you. How do you do your search functions? So, um, and we'll go, if you do join next week for the uh, coding basics, we'll go a little bit more details into all of these settings, um, what synonym means, what diacritical means, but we're really short, getting short on time. So I'll just show you real quick, when you want to look up a term in, in uh, the browser, you don't have to put in a full term. So if I look up convulsion and I hit enter, and I leave it at default settings, it's gonna default to show me every single level term. So it will show me all of these possible level terms if it founds the words convulsion. And not just the word convulsion, it will show me if it found an exact match, if it found a lexical variant, if I have more than one word, and any synonym matches. So it's gonna look for anything with epilepsy or with seizure or with anti-convulsant, right? It's gonna give me all these different options. And it will tell me which level it found it at, the LLT, PT, HLT, HLGT. Well, if I'm interested in a specific order of, ver of, of words, so let's say I wanted to begin with general, and then I wanted to contain convulsion, and then I hit enter, then it will show me the options that start with the, pre uh, the preferred uh, order that I wanted. All right, so you can do it either with an advanced search or you can go back to your to your basic search. And I'm sorry that we can't go through more of these this demo, but I do want to go back and wrap up uh, with the SMQ. So what are SMQs? And again, this will only be a brief uh, overview because we do have webinars that are um, targeted towards data retrieval and analyses and targeted towards query building. You can find them, like we said, on our website under the training schedule. So we saw how Medra helps you group like terms together. So this happens in the high level terms, the HLT, uh, HLT terms. This also happens in the HLGT terms. But these HLT and HLGT terms, they don't always give you a full comprehensive picture of a specific area of interest. And even if you used your secondary socks, you might still miss some relevant terms that may reside in socks 
that are not multi-axial. So there's restrictions there on how you can get a full comprehensive picture of an area of interest. So SMQs were created for a standard approach in the identification and retrieval of MEDRA coded data that may be helpful in addressing a specific safety question. So they help you retrieve cases of interest, whether you want to call them uh, ICSRs or you want to call them just uh, relevant cases of, of interest by grouping terms in MEDRA at the PT level from all over MEDRA. So it doesn't matter which SOC the PTs belong to, they are all grouped together under this single SMQ. So that's the, the, um, the beauty and, and the functionality of SMQs is that they are not restricted by the placement rules of terms in the MEDRA hierarchy. And these terms that they are collecting is not necessarily a medical diagnosis. It could be signs, it could be symptoms, it could be diagnoses or syndromes or physical findings or lab findings or physiological test data or procedures that are relevant to your area of interest, right? So how are MEDRA or how are SMQs constructed? The, the construction of SMQs occurs at the preferred term level. And we said that preferred term is the term that, that is representative of the equivalent LLTs. So any LLTs that are subordinate to a PT, which was included in an SMQ, are also included in that SMQ. And this only happens at the LLT and the PT levels, right? The LLT levels that are not in a PT included in an SMQ are excluded from that SMQ. And the way that the SMQ works is when you run the SMQ, whether you run it at the PT level or you can also run it at the LLT level, depending on which level your data is available in, uh, it depends on finding those terms that you coded in MEDRA that belong to that SMQ. So if you coded your terms and one of your, your LLTs like LLT1 was also an LLT1 that is subordinate to a PT included in this particular SMQ, then that's a hit. And the, the, the query will be able to identify that for you. For information on how to approach data retrieval and analysis, ICH also has an ICH endorsed guide, also called a points to consider, but this one is called data retrieval and presentation. And this is really very useful for options for the industry or regulatory purposes. It's best when it's used in conjunction with the PTC document for uh, term selection. And of course, this also is recommended to be used as a basis for your own individual organization's uh, specific retrieval conventions. So how many SMQs do we have? So as of version 25, and I believe also 26, we had a total of 110 level one SMQs. And just looking at the list, you can tell that all of these things are bad things, right? We, we wanna be able to capture these signals. So that's why SMQs help you identify areas of interest uh, which address safety topics. But we also have sub SMQs. So these are level one SMQs. Some of them are um, hierarchical SMQs that have sub SMQs. So we have about another 120 more SMQs that are a little bit more detailed in levels two up until level five. Um, what are the benefits and limitations of SMQs? So yes, they help you standardize data, right? Because you are working on standardized data, you wanna be able to retrieve data um, also in a, a way that you can share it across therape therapeutic areas um, in a way that is reusable, that is validated, that is standardized, that is consistent. And the best part to you is that maintaining these SMQs is the responsibility of the MSSO team. So every time we have a release, we, we have already looked at any new ter any terms that were added or modified to see if there was impact to the relevant SMQs for those terms. So that's all was done by the MSSO on your behalf, but there are limitations. So the SMQs, no matter how many we provide, they can't possibly cover every single topic of interest. So um, if we don't have something that matches your needs, you have to find another way 
for summarization, either via the HLTs or the HLGTs, or creating your own custom queries. And um, if that, you know, if that is the case, there are certain things you need to be aware of, and those can be um, explained to you in, in more details in those webinars that address those topics. Another limitation in the SMQs is that scientific data keeps changing. The SMQs will also change. They will keep undergoing evolution and undergoing refinements. So an, an important po point to keep in mind is just like with the version report, when you're using an SMQ, please make sure you are using the SMQ version that matches the version of Medra your data was coded in. And SMQs can be applicable across all uh, phases in, in uh, clinical research, pre and post marketing. Um, and the question on which to apply really depends on how much you know your product. So if your safety profile is not fully yet known to you, you can use multiple SMQs routinely as a screening tool. Or if you have identified areas of interest to you, you can use those selected SMQs. Um, for example, if you have a known class effect for your product. On the post-marketing area of it, you can use SMQs for retrieving cases of suspected or known safety issues. You can use them for signal detection. You can use them for case alerts if your system supports that kind of um, programming where it can actually trigger if one of your terms was coded to a term that belongs in an SMQ of interest to you and of course in periodic reporting. So to summarize, we went over the background information about MEDRA, the scope, the structure and characteristics of MEDRA, um, the maintenance process of MEDRA. We demoed some of the MEDRA tools. We discussed principles of coding with MEDRA, introduced you to the PTC guidance documents and briefly talked about the SMQs. Our slides also offer links of interest to you like the FAQs and the Metro browsers and how to submit change requests, our training schedule and support documentation. So I know we're coming up to the hour and I um, would like to open it up for questions and answers. If we have any, I'm happy to stay on and address. So if you, if you had any questions that you posted, uh, I'm happy to stay on and answer them. Hannah, do we have any questions? The only question we have at the moment, it was just uh, expressing interest in being able to watch a recording of this session. Okay, so if we don't have any technical issues when saving the file, I think Hannah already mentioned that it will take a couple of days, right, Hannah, to be posted? <laughs> it should be posted within just a few days if there's no issues. Awesome. Any other questions? Uh, no, we're just getting uh, comments thanking you for a very informative session. All right, awesome. Um, so um, thank you all for your attendance today. This was, um, I hope, a, a good overview for, for Medra. As I said, we do have an upcoming webinar next week for Coding Basics and um, the week after that for Advanced Coding. So please feel free to um, Register for those if you're interested, and I wish you all a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you.